Hello and welcome to the MotoGP Extra Podcast. Joining me today, as always, is Reese from Biker Gaming. Now, round 15 comes from northern Spain and Aragon. It was the return of Mark Marquez. We had some drama Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all the way up to the final race of the weekend. As always, we start with Moto3. We have some weird incidents to talk before the race on pretty much Saturday. Some terrible incidents and some brilliant, uh, we'll say, inclusion from the Moto G- MotoGP kind of paddock towards the all-woman team. We'll get to that in a minute. But first race, we have to start off with Max Racing Mechanics grabbing Fernandez as he left for his final exit in Q2. I saw it on Twitter. About a thousand times, I've seen so many different angles. What did you make of it? Give me my opinions on it. It's just so bizarre because, in fact, I saw you posted the. I think you posted the Twitter link on Discord because I hadn't seen it before, and uh, then I saw the clip. And to be honest, I actually watched it a couple of times because I didn't realize what happened at first. Because I was, I was just looking at Fernandez's bike. I was sort of looking to the left, so I didn't see who approached him. I thought that was like his own team that had stopped him. I watched did it I a couple actually. times. Yeah, and then I realized oh wait, those are two rival mechanics on the Max Racing team, so it was, it was just such a bizarre incident, it was just like, why are they doing this? Like, what what was that for? It makes it even worse when, you, like, initially I thought, you know, maybe it was an accident, they just hadn't got out of the way quick enough, that was like maybe the second or third time, and then you watch it again and you realise no, that was completely deliberate, especially when you consider the fact that the actual next garage to Tech 3 is CIP, so not even Max Racing, so those mechanics had no reason to be there whatsoever. So they literally just did it to spite uh, Fernandez, it seems. But that's literally all it seems. They just had sort of some sort of personal vendetta against him or something. I'm, I'm not sure. I think there's more to it because obviously Adrian was in that team in Max Racing last year, and it it kind of ended on bad terms. But what those two mechanics have done, you know, they've just they have been sanctioned. Uh, the team have come out and condemned them and stuff. So I imagine that that is just a, two rogues going and doing that. So they like sort of grabbed Adrian's break as well, apparently that's on the telemetry. So they, uh, it's unacceptable, unacceptable behavior. And to be honest, I don't think they've been banned for enough. They've uh, received a two race ban. It is suspended because it would be unsafe for them to try and find a replacement so quickly. Like there's only a week to the next race. So they wouldn't be able to find a decent replacement. So for safety reasons, they've been allowed to go to the next round anyway. And um, then after that, they've got they, they, they got like they get two thousand euro fine each and two race ban. I think it was, but yeah. it's not it's not really enough. It's so like because it's dangerous in a pit lane as well as it is. You don't need people messing around and grabbing riders' brakes. I mean, what if Adrian had sort of had a little bit of lean angle and was pulling away? He could easily have crashed in the pit lane. It's just I mean, it's just a horrible thing to do anyway, regardless unsporting. But it's also dangerous, super unsporting behavior. I think it really upset Adrian Fernandez as well. Apparently, apparently he came back to the pits and was crying, which you know makes sense because it would bother you that kind of thing. Whatever your opinion is on the guy, you know whether you've had a bad experience working with him before, you don't do that. It's unacceptable, especially when let's be honest, he's a young kid as well. It's just disrespectful as well to the whole championship the Tech Three team. I'm glad. I'm actually really happy the way that Max Racing dealt with it. They immediately you know were out with a statement. Max and Peter Ertel have gone and apologised personally to Hervé Poncherol, so they've done a, they've done the right thing there. But it's just such a weird incident, just unacceptable, completely terrible. Yeah, I completely agree. It was shocking, and I do agree that the penalty just isn't enough. Uh, the backlash from the community was that they should be banned permanently, which a lot of people agree with. Now, a lot of people are saying, was it deployed by Max Racing to go go down there to two V and get in the way? Either way, they should have had enough uh, morality to say no if they were told to do that, and I don't believe they would have been told to go down there. I reckon they would have done it of their own decision because they would have probably just lost the plot that people were following Sasaki. And yeah, uh, I think something like have... Adrian Fernandez was particularly a threat to them yeah, this weekend. It's, like... it's, yeah, it's just if anything, you drag a rider who doesn't have the race pace up into a place that he can just be a little bit of a we'll say roadblock in the race. It probably would have benefited him, but anyway. Um, terrible but moving on to something a lot more lighter Herrera's team so Maria Herrera who is a very very fast female motor 3 rider she's been in the class before came back for a wild card in an all woman team Reese, what did you make of this and when did you hear this for the first time coming about it was very last minute from what I believe 
Um, the, I heard about it quite a while ago, uh, a few months ago. Oh, fair fact. enough. <laughs> so I think it's been in the works for a while. Um, it's it's to do with the sponsor for the the team. So I think I think it was with the MTA team officially. So the wildcard entry because all of the teams have to any wildcard has to be with an official team that has a proper hospitality and all that kind of things because it's quite strict, obviously, with it being the the top Grand Prix paddock. Uh, so I think I think it's Angelus. I'm not 100 sure how it's pronounced, but that is the one of the sponsors of that team, and that was the main sponsor on this bike. And they are, I believe, they are a women in motorsport company. So that was they were sort of all behind it. I, th- I think it was just a nice idea, to be honest. I remember reading about it before, uh, like obviously when I first read the news a couple of months ago. I think it was a couple of months ago. Anyway, that it was just it was just nice to see. I think it's really good because apparently it was lots of different sort of women from different teams in sort of junior GP by the sounds of it. So a lot of young sort of young up and comers as well. So it's not just experienced people. It's people that are trying to find their way in the paddock and they've done a weekend. I mean, I'm sure it will be a big experience, you know, to work with an actual Grand Prix, like work in an actual Grand Prix paddock, work with the rider. You know, Herrera has been, she's been about a bit, you know, she's been in Moto3, she's been in Moto E for the last few years. She's been in World Super Sport. So she's been in some professional paddocks. She's been in some decent teams as well. She was in Mon Lao, you know, as a junior. So she's worked with some good people. So I'm sure the experience of the the, the mechanics working with her has rubbed off well. Mechanics working with the team, her working with, you know, a full female team, because I'm sure there's some difference there because, you know, as much as we, we like to think it's not the case, there definitely is some sort of, um, that there can be some prejudice. So, you, you know, that's po- probably something that's been experienced by most of the people involved. So I'm glad to see the fact that they are trying to be more inclusive. And I think it's something we could, I think we should definitely try and see it again. I mean, obviously they had a tough weekend, but they're going to. So maybe if they had a few, perhaps if they can do it a couple more times next year, a few of the European rounds, perhaps they can sort of build up some momentum and get some slightly better results. Because of course, coming in the way they did, they were never going to really challenge for anything. But I think overall they did a, they did a good job. The bike ran well all weekend. You know, I don't think Herrera made any particular mistake or anything like that either. And she's been off a Moto3 bike for quite a long time now. So I think it's just great to see. Hopefully we can see more of it. Hopefully we can see more teams as well. And, you know, hopefully we'll just see more women working in the teams and stuff as well. Even, you know, not even just all women's teams, just throughout all of the different parts of the paddock. I think it's, it's great to see and hopefully we'll see some more. Yeah. And it'll be great maybe in the future if we got a, a full season of an all women team. It'd be nice. Nice touch for the grid when you have a world champion in Anna Carrasco. You have a very talented rider, Maria Herrera. So they are out there. They can be, they can be top level athletes, and I reckon the mechanics and teams can be too. So maybe going forward, we might see a bit more of this. But moving on now to the race, Eisen Guevara had an amazing start. Got into the lead. Looked like he had just enough pace. He had a kind of a big group of about three people, four people. And then it split down to the smaller group that pulled away after they managed to just drop the gap from P4 back. Then pace looked very sharp. What did you make of his race weekend? Did you believe in the race he could do it? Or did you reckon Sasaki and Holgado would get onto the back of him eventually? Well, after the start and after he pulled away so much in the first lap, I was fairly certain he was going to win especially when it wasn't even showing you any of it. Usually, you know, <laughs> Moto3, they do like to keep an eye on the scrap for the lead. So when they're not showing it, there's uh, absolutely no scrap going on. But it's it's kind of something Guevara's done a little bit this season. Well, actually, done a lot this season, really. He's gone around the whole weekend doing laps on his own, making sure, you know, that he can do the pace on his own. He doesn't need the slipstream. He gets the perfect line. He's put the bike on pole position. It's, it's like a Jorge Martin kind of ride. It was something Jorge Martin did a lot in his title winning year back in 2018. And in fact, he did the same thing at this track as well. He pulled away from the pack. People seem to think that it's very difficult to do at this circuit, which is the case. But if you get a good start, if you can have that slipstream gap gone on the first lap, you can absolutely pull away here because it's a very technical circuit in some parts. And when you're battling, you lose a lot of time. So as soon as Guevara got to the lead, I was fairly sure he was going to win. And to be honest, it was a champion's ride. We've seen a couple of races from him this season that looked really good. But this one especially, we'll probably come on to it later about his championship rivals, but this one put him in the driver's seat for me. I think he's definitely favourite for the championship now, and what a race it was. Yeah, I must say, we his team not having a great weekend, we'll get to him in a bit, but takes a nice lead now going into flyaways. He's not, he's kind of one of the odd riders in the Moto3 class where he can do it at the front on his own, so it'll be interesting to see 
Will you be able to do the Thailand, Japan, Sepang, them kind of tracks where you've long straights and uh, it might be a bit hard to get away. And then you never know. We've seen in all classes, if you don't get the start or you're slightly off the ball, it's so easy to be skittled. So he probably is the closest to the title now, but it could be anyone's game yet. So I'm going to still I'm gonna hold my vote yet until I've seen at least one flyaway at a track that he doesn't have experience. But he definitely, for me at the moment, is the fastest man on track. Moving on though, we had a very good scrap from fourth down. It was a six, seven man battle throughout the field. It was pretty much all we saw, as you mentioned, that the front three were kind of wheels in line, following each other, doing a smart race for once. But the battle fourth raged on all the way to the last corner. What did you make of the unusual battle? Because it's usually for the victory, you usually don't have a three riders that are pulled away. And uh, even though it wasn't for the podium, it's still very, very entertaining. Yeah, it wasn't for the podium, but they sure act like, acted like it was, eh? <laughs> it was a good battle. Obviously, you got basically the usual suspects up there. You know, you had Den Dennis Onchu, um, David Munoz getting pretty aggressive with people. Garcia was obviously in that pack. It was interesting to see how far of that pack Fodger really was, to be honest. He was absolutely nowhere, but there were some aggressive passes coming, especially from Munoz. We may as well talk about it now. Obviously, he got that long lap penalty for actually bashing Adrian Fernandez, who was actually having a pretty good weekend. Obviously, aside from having his uh, <laughs> his brake grabbed in the pits and being stopped from going out. But in terms of pace, he was looking pretty good in the race uh, until obviously he got hit off. There was uh, Messiah in there. Obviously, Messiah having a pretty good weekend. I think he's a bit, you know, a bit of a, a comeback because he struggled a little bit the last few rounds, but seemed a bit more competitive this weekend, probably with that new contract for Leopard in his pocket that was announced this weekend. He's returning to that team. But yeah, it was, I mean, it was just the, the typical Moto 3 scrap, really, just. It was for fourth instead of first. Lots of aggressive passes. Most of it was fairly clean, to be fair. Aside from the couple of moves from Munoz into like turn five, I think yeah. turn four. Five. Yeah, turn five. Uh, so yeah, it was yeah, it was pretty much what you'd expect. Standard motor three just changed the position from first to fourth. Yeah, and you did cover Munoz there. He uh, he ba he basically ruined our, um, the other riders' race him because he just picked yeah, him up he so sent aggressively. Him to the shadow realm, really, didn't he? <laughs> yeah, he like. They said it in commentary that uh, Fernandez, yeah, his race was over. Like he come like at turn five, it's almost a hairpin. It's probably a slightly open hairpin you could call. It. So when you run off track there, you, you couldn't lose any hope of getting back in. And it wasn't. There was about six lap left. So he did get he, back to the pack, but yeah, it yeah, definitely yeah. Affected it him just a lot. you probably have to use the extra bit of tire. Probably pushing too much. It's it's never easy. So. Uh, maybe early in the race, he, oh, 100% agree, yeah. But maybe yeah. if it was a bit early in the race, he might have been got back. But Fadja, like I said, didn't have a great weekend. Garcia, kind of similarly, had issues towards the end of the race. What did you make of the other two title favourites? Do you reckon they're showing signs of cracks or just a unusual weekend in Aragon? A little bit unusual, but we've seen this with Fadja plenty of times before. Uh, I mean, he just he literally just won the last race at Masana, didn't he? Yeah. And he comes here and nowhere. And he's done that before. Obviously, like, he was nowhere for ages, then won at Silverstone. Then he was nowhere again at Austria. Then he wins again at Masano. Then he's nowhere again at Aragon. Aragon, a track which he won at, like, twice, I think, before? Or, no, he, he won at last year, didn't he? Don't think yeah, he's won he there did, another yeah. time. Yeah, so he, he won there in, <laughs> last year when Pedro Costa was sort of in his phase of the season struggling. But this time he turns up and it's absolutely nowhere. I mean, of course, we do know that that Leopard Honda does seem to have lost a little bit of its speed compared to some of the others. And we do know this is a track where straight line speed is super, super important. But he just seemed nowhere. And I think that's just him at this point. You can't really say it's the, the bike is struggling, but the Leopard Honda seems to be good enough to st sort of still be up there. Honestly, the rest of the Hondas, not so much. But then maybe you say, well, the bike is clearly good enough if you run it correctly, but it's just really getting the maximum out of it to even get up there. So Suzuki was up there. So again, it's just down to Fodger. Garcia, yeah, he he's had a couple of off weekends as well. He's definitely struggling a little bit now. I don't know whether maybe there's something going on in the team a little bit. Not saying that the team are doing anything to him, but maybe he's got his head's down a little bit now because I be as we believe, Guevara is the one that's been selected to go. Well, actually, we know that uh, Garcia is leaving that fold next year to go to Pons Racing in Moto2. But I believe the decision to take Guevara up to Moto 2 in the Aspar team was taken a while ago. So I don't know whether maybe that's just got to Garcia. Perhaps he feels like he, you know, he's not the 
the favourite. I mean, I'm sure they are being treated the same in the team, but it, it's a psychological thing, I guess, isn't it? Just not being picked. Perhaps that's getting to him a little bit, and he's struggling. He sees the championships slipping away. But then I think also throughout previous seasons, he's been a bit like this too. He's been up a bit up and down. So I feel like Guevara is just a guy that's more consistent. And that's kind of how he's won his junior world championship a couple of years ago as well. I think Acosta was the faster of the two, but just less consistent. And I think, again, you're seeing the kind of thing here, except this time he really does have the raw pace because he's not consistently second or third. He's consistently first. So yeah, Fodger and Garcia just seem to be really lost now. And I think... They're going to have to find their feet quickly if they want to still have a chance at this championship. Yeah, I, I do agree. And you make a good point to that Garcia is leaving that team and leaving the kind of trajectory up into Mortal 2. Now, the way I see it is, if you look back to around Silverstone, a couple of rounds before that, we'll go back as far as the late European rounds, Garcia would be kind of in mid-race he'd be behind his teammate, but near towards the end of the race, he'd always find a way to get three positions ahead of his teammate. And you go, Jesus... He's, you just can't beat this kid and I know in Silverstone he got taken out but I think since then Guevara's had the pace and he's kind of just sharpened up his race craft and his positioning during the race to the point where he doesn't end up getting swamped on the last lap finishing seven where his teammate scrapes on on third with a brilliant last corner overtake and I think that's just I think I always believe Guevara was the quicker of the two, but I think Garcia was such an aggressive and such an a kind of elite scrapper that he got himself into positions that his pace wasn't always willing to get him there. And I think now Guevara is just starting to show there is a bit of gap in pace there, and I think Guevara is the better rider. And a good good point you're mentioning where they chose Guevara to be the successor to one of the one or two riders at the moment. So I do believe that that's played a big thing. You mentioned how it plays with their mental effects and the, the mentality of sport. It's so mental, this sport. You, it's, it's just ridiculous how much having a right mindset or having a wrong mindset in Garcia's case could play such a fold. And at the moment, it looks like really out of the two of them, you wouldn't really put anything on either of them to win the championship. The only thing they have going is they have a bit more experience than Aizan. But then again... Uh, are they going to be able to turn around I don't know it's going to be very interesting all three classes have a lovely run in after this weekend so every class has lots of question marks and we'll find out a lot in Japan in only a week's time which is brilliant but we're going to move on now to Moto2 and on Saturday morning we got pictures leaked of Augusto Fernandez sitting on the curbs wearing a Gas Gas MotoGP t-shirt Fast forward about 90 minutes to two hours later, we had our press release that he has signed for Gas Gas MotoGP, the worst kept secret in the MotoGP paddock for about a month now. Reese, shocked or surprised, or did you kind of expect to see him announce this weekend? I am so shocked, I can hardly contain it. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, I think all of the transfers this year have been the worst kept secrets. Everybody yeah. knew Mir was going to Repsol Honda for months. Everybody knew this was happening for a while, basically ever since the Remy Gardner thing. So they came out that he wasn't saying it's like, well, the, the guy that's in the junior team is obviously going to get the seat. So yeah, I, I think it's good for Augusto because, you know, he, at the minute he's really on form in Moto2, championship leader. I do obviously feel for Remy Gardner and Ralph Fernandez, but uh, well, well, Ralph Fernandez wanted to leave, to be fair. I feel, I feel for Remy Gardner, I guess, being kicked out of the team. But Augusto Fernandez, you know what? He's... I guess he's earned it. You can't really say that he hasn't if he wraps up this championship, which obviously you don't know whether he's going to, but as of current, he's leading it. You can't wait till the end of the season. Well, you probably could wait till the end of the season to sign them, to be honest, but probably wouldn't be the best idea to do that. So from the data they have, they're signing the best guy because they're signing the Moto2 guy that's currently leading. And he's in their, in their fold already in the IO team. So yeah, I think it could be good. He, he could learn from Paul Spagger quite a lot as well, because obviously Paul has ridden the KTM in the past, and I'm sure Paul is going to give a lot of uh, lot back to that project, and he might be a good mentor for Augusto, obviously a very experienced rider as well. So you know what? It could be a good move for him. Uh, I do question the KTM package a little bit, but I guess we'll see how, how he gets on. Hopefully they don't just sack him after a year like they've been doing to everybody else. If they do, they're definitely going to be in trouble because... I'm going to say, say, you know, I think the managers and stuff are going to notice. I mean, if you're Pedro Costa right now and you've just seen what's happened to uh, Raul Fernandez and Remy Gardner and then the same thing happens the next year to Augusto Fernandez, so you're not going to be wanting, wanting to go there. So hopefully they do treat Augusto 
a bit more fairly than they have in the past, but I guess we'll have to see. But I think he could be quite good on a MotoGP bike, so we'll, f- we'll just have to see how it pans out for him. Yeah, I, I get the impression, with no disrespect to Augusto, that he's a bench warmer or seat warmer for Pedro Costa. Yeah. I think they, I think they made a big mistake this year having two rookies. You touched upon how they'll have Espargaro next year back into the KTM family, shall we say. I reckon it's an experienced rider with a bike that he's known for a while now. Of course, he was on Honda for a bit, so you could say it might take him pre-season and maybe the first three or four rounds to get back up to sharp KTM slash gas gas pace. But I reckon it'll be better for him or be better for Augusto to have an experienced rider instead of having two rookies where they're both lost and no one to bounce off. Now, of course, they probably could look at the factory rider's data, but you're looking at... Brad Binder, who's probably one of the top four or five riders in the championship on ability, in my opinion. That's probably the equivalent of the Honda riders looking at Marquez data, saying, well, I can't just do that, so simple, that's no good to me. And Miguel apparently has a bit of an odd, weird riding style, so maybe having Paul in there might bring him on a bit more, but I still, honestly, I still feel that he's going to get chucked out. And with Remy Gardner, I feel it's terrible. He's a Moto2 World Championship winner in 2021. Did it the hard way, was there in a class for years, got his chance, took it with both hands, and now he is on his way to a second seed in the World Superbikes or back to Moro 2 with a mid to top level team. So it's he's not right. He's confirmed. a confirm now, he's gone back to a Superbike. So yeah. Yeah, he's going to the um, GRT team. GRT. So yeah, it was back and forth between them. So it's finally confirmed now that he's off to Superbike. So yeah, that could be the end. I Like, I don't see. It's usually a one-way ticket when you leave GP. You don't come back. Just look at Scott Redding. Um, you don't come back to this paddock when you leave. So that's such a tragedy. Like he's literally one year on a B Tech KTM. Jesus, that's uh, poor enough. But we are going to move on now to the race where Augusto initially broke away. He had initial comfort where other riders seem to struggle the likes of Dixon went backwards couldn't stick with him his teammate uh, Pedro Costa seemed to be on the pace but what did you make of Augusto's initial break and were you fearing that we'd have another runaway leader like Moto3 yeah to be honest I was we've seen Augusto do it before this season Saxon Ring being the best example I think he won by like 9 seconds or something ridiculous and it's Saxon Ring so you know that's like about 30 seconds anywhere else is huge gap that is so I thought we were going to see something similar, especially with, um, it was clear that Dixon was struggling a little bit to at least keep with his pace. Oh, we know he just struggled a little bit on a, a full a full tank. But once you had Acosta and Canet come through and you saw the gap sort of starting to shrink, I knew that there's something potentially could happen. But Augusta has been so good at race management this year, especially from the front. I did think he might still have a good chance at it. But as soon as Costa got, got a bit of a sniff, he went for it, and that's what we uh, that's what we love to see from Acosta. May as well talk about his race. It was it was fantastic. It's good to see him back. Obviously, the first win he's had since the uh, the injury. I think second win of the, win of the season because I think he obviously won at Mugello previously. Was on course to win in Le Mans and fell off. So you know what, you, you kind of forget he's a rookie, don't you? Uh, and everyone kind of put such pressure. Was expecting him to be the you know like a world champion straight away. So when you look at it that way, you're like, oh, he's not had that great of a season, but. He actually has. He's had a very good season. It's just the expectation going in was so high. So, yeah, he just showed his class once again. You know, he's beat a guy that's MotoGP bound on the same equipment. So, you know, that uh, says a lot about the guy. I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to seeing him next year, seeing what he can do. Uh, I'm sure, I, I'm pretty sure he's probably going to win the championship next year. But not, we're not here to talk about that. We're here to, here to talk about his race right now. It was it's just perfect, really. He, he qualified well for once, which is nice to see because he does struggle a bit in qualifying. Got a clean start, didn't make any mistakes early on. He saw his teammate getting away, didn't panic, made a move on Canet, made a move on Dixon, and then just hunted after him. Caught him, slipstream past him, made it a nice clean move, so nothing dangerous. Just great race from Acosta. Obviously, a good initial breakaway from Augusto, but unfortunately, it was the, well, unfortunately for him anyway, he got caught up. But, you know, he managed to bring it home well as well. So a good race for the Ayo boys. Yeah, and it was a good race for the championship because Ayagor didn't lose too many points. He has his home race next week. And Costa just starting to get an idea. Obviously, he had his injury that probably would took away a couple of race wins, in my opinion. Yeah, um, definitely. He was really, he's really starting to run that uh, 
form because he won it with Jello, didn't he? Then on the yeah. podium against Saxon Ring. So, and then we were going to likes of Aston and stuff like that. You you never know where like races like that where he was quick in more of three, of course, different categories. But um, I still would have fancied him for a good result there. But like you did say for next year, he probably already is the title favourite. If you look at who's moving up, he's staying with the same team, championship proven team. It's going to be a tough battle to beat him, but he was brilliant today. I really enjoyed watching him. He's he's just a, such a... I, I don't like comparing it to Marquez because I, I, I can remember when Rossi was in his pump and everyone that was coming through was like, oh, he's the next Rossi. I don't like to say Acosta is the next Marquez because he's his own entity. He'll be the new king, we'll say, I reckon, because I reckon in a couple of years' time we'll see Acosta versus Quattararo, Bagnaia, Martin, and the likes of that. So I reckon he is the next big star and he's just, he's phenomenal on a bike. I could watch him ride around all day. Um, Again today, he was doing things that no one else could do and he probably won comfortably. So, and he's a new girlfriend, so that's, everything's going well for him at the moment. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see. But we're going to move on now to Japanese lad of Ayagora. Not the best weekend. Um, I said this quite a bit all year. He dug in and he got the best out of it he finished one position behind his nearest championship rival took as many points out of a weekend that the likes of Jake Dixon crashed on the last lap he had a very good battle with uh, Tony Abellino and just seems to have it in the race the uh, battling in the race like his race uh, craft seems quite good he Jesus I was watching him coming into turn 9 10 that downhill left hander the left hander after Mark Marcus corner and he was on opposite lock 12 I think isn't it 12 is it yeah so opposite lock backing it in and I was I remember shouting at the TV the first time he tried to pass Arbelino like you're not getting that stopped and he pulled down to the apex and I was in shock so I have hope, big hopes for him when he finally makes a jump to GP and also next year I go over to the cost of that could be pretty juicy what did you make of Iogor again today? Very good performance, in my opinion. How did you find he handled a slightly difficult weekend? He just kind of has a little knack for doing this. He, when he's struggling, you know, he, he he just picks up the pieces. He had to come through Q1, if I recall correctly. So, you know, he struggled in practice. Didn't qualify too badly on the grid. I think he's at sixth place. And he just sort of, he just takes it home. It's it's like Masano again. Obviously, Masano, he struggled as well. Attritional race. People losing their heads, crashing. He just kept it up upright on two wheels. You know, Agora knows the re- weekends when he can win. He knows, like you know, in Hereth and in Austria, when he's got the pace to go to the front and try and pull away. But he never takes an unnecessary risk. You know, he could have tried. He could have tried to go with that front group, tried to get on the podium, and could have crashed and lost twenty foot. Well, not twenty five points. It would have turned out, but sixteen points. But he doesn't. He just sits there. You know, he builds the race. He lets the race come to him. You know, he, he ended up cashed up to the back of Jake Dixon, passing him. I think he caught Aldeguer and passed him as well. I th- you know, he, he caught and passed Tony Arbolino. So, you know, he, he just he just has his way of going through it. He knows when it's a tough weekend. Just bring the bike home. Just, you know, hit all of his marks, hit his apexes. That's just the kind of rider he is. He's, just, he's got such a cool head. He doesn't worry about the actual race going on about him. He just focuses on himself. Even back to the races where he's won, like, you know, Chantra came diving up the inside of him at the penultimate turn. You know, he didn't bother about that. He just cut back underneath him. He just took his line. He's He just has such a cool head about him. And that's why he's in this position. And that's why he almost won the Moto3 Championship a couple of years ago. Because he knew on the weekends where he could do well, he did well. On the weekends where he couldn't do well, he just he settled. And he ended up getting a good result out of it because he didn't lose his head. He didn't crash. So, yeah, a well-managed weekend by Agora. And you know what? He's going to make a great MotoGP rider one day because he just he has that, that you know he has a temperament in those races where the tires are going to go off in a bit of a tricky dish conditions. You know the kind of races where you see the intelligent riders like Oliveira and people that come through. He's definitely going to be winning some of those races. So it'll uh, it'll be great to see. And like you say, next year it could be interesting because we do know Acosta he is a thinking man's rider as well to some mm-hmm. extent. But uh, Agora. He's just the next level, so there could be a few times where he picks up the pieces. Yeah, and uh, again, keep himself in the championship by just doing the utmost that he can do in that weekend. So we're going to move on now to the GP, and I once again, 
before the weekend started, we had the announcement of two riders coming back. Both Honda riders, one is currently riding Yamaha, Mark is return and Crutchlow's also back. Rhys, what did you make of Marcus's return his whole weekend? And same for Crutchlow, who I must say had a phenomenal weekend on a bike that Davi couldn't get near the top 10 all year. And Crutchlow jumps on and he made it look pretty damn good. Well, I've got to say, to be honest, um, it was great to see Marquez back. Obviously, it was great to see Cal Crutchlow's back as well, because it's always nice to see Cal in the paddock. You know, he always tries hard, but... Obviously, you know, that's just sort of a replacement thing because Dovey's retired, but Marquez to come back from the injury has more of that kind of story behind it. Although I suppose Crutchlow's return does also have a nice little story, but, you know, it was nice to see Marquez back. It was nice, uh, you know, MotoGP does miss a little bit without him. I mean, I'm not one of those guys that particularly says, oh, you need to have Marquez or you have to have, like, you know, I'm not like one of those people that's like, oh, MotoGP's been rubbish since Rossi left or whatever, you know. But Marquez does add a certain spectacle to it, you know, back you know it was sort of similar to like back in like 2010 when Rossi was out he broke his leg it wasn't quite the same with that I mean you need that top guy that's you know star power is what I would yeah call it. yeah exactly the star power the the guy that you know he sells the merchandise he sells the tickets you know he makes the races interesting and as we'll get on to later the race was quite interesting because of him <laughs> you know not necessarily his fault but uh you know, it was uh, it was not a according bit of a to Twitter. Int- it's not. <laughs> Everyone else well, on Twitter is absolutely. You don't want to go on Twitter. Him. Yeah, that was my first mistake. <laughs> like that Marquez guy, he's terrible. <laughs> but yeah, no, we saw him running the Masana test a couple of weeks ago. He ran a little bit on the first day. Felt pretty good, but you know, been advised to only run the morning. Then ran a bit longer the next day. His pace was right there immediately. So he comes here. It was great to see. You know, he'd done a bit of testing on the six hundred between as well. You know, he seemed like he was ready. He, he was straight away on the pace in practice. Again, it's kind of similar to his previous comeback. He could do a few laps together, but not a long run. It's a shame we didn't get to see his full race, to be honest, because it would have been interesting to see how it panned out. But yeah, he already had a save within like a couple of sessions, had a couple of, had like a crash, you know, almost high sided himself off a few times. So <laughs> Marquez is back. And it's nice to see. It, it does add a bit more excitement. It does uh, when he's back. Yeah, there, there's always something with Marcus. You never have a quiet Marcus weekend. No, no, you don't. <laughs> He's either crashing, saving, breaking, killing. There's always something going Following on. Following somebody, yeah, like getting exactly. in his head. <laughs> yeah, he's, there's always something going on. He's great for He's great entertainment. But we are now going to jump into the race. First lap, first sector and a half, we'll say. There was absolute carnage up until the reverse course crew where all the drama from the race happened. Of course, the race was good after that, but no one else crashed in the race. It was pretty, pretty decent. Now, at the front, the battles were quite uh, Motor 3-esque, where they were following each other, seeing what the tyres were at. But that first lap, Reese, who, what, where, and how did you kind of process the first lap, or half a lap, shall we say? Well, there was a... It was just such a shock. You get the start as you do, and uh, well, I, you know, I was watching Fabio. I wanted to see like how his start went because, of course, he's on the Yamaha. We knew this was going to be a rough track for him, so I saw him, and then I saw Marquez was in front of him. I was like, Marquez has had a good start. Uh, it's like bloody hell, he's come from like thirteenth place. He's already in front of Fabio, and then all of a sudden, you just see Fabio just ram Marquez up the back, go flying up in the air. Oh, it was a horrendous accident. Fortunately, he's, he's relatively okay, it seems. I think he has a bit of a burn on him as well. Um, I'm not sure if, if that's from scrubbing him down the track or if that's off the exhaust of the bike or you know whatever that is. But I mean, he got he got a hefty hit from the bike. So, yeah, that wasn't uh, ideal. Fortunately, he was okay. But what actually happened was Marquez was... Uh, well, he was going through what, turn, th- turn four in front of him. Or turn three, sorry. In front of him. turn three, yeah. Yeah, except turn three. And uh, in front of Marquez, he said that Aleish and Enea Bashanini had a little bit of like a con- contact. So Marquez tried to turn it a little bit tighter to cut underneath them. And, you know, start of the race, he was a little bit offline anyway. Tries to turn it a bit tighter, cold tire, and just, just unfortunately, almost threw himself off. You know, fortunately, he saved himself because it could have been quite nasty if he'd also fallen off. But Fabio, so close behind him. Fabio, you know, he's been taking risks all year to try and make these passes, especially on the opening laps. He has to run close. He has to carry the speed. Now, on a first lap, everybody's close. So if someone slows down and you're right behind them, nothing you're going to do. It'd be the exact same if Marquez's bike had cut out. There's no way Fabio was going to be able to avoid him. 
And unfortunately, Marquez has to roll out the throttle because, of course, he's not going to continue to accelerate thinking, oh, someone's behind me and high side himself off because he doesn't want to get run over. So, of course, he has to back out the throttle. Unfortunately for Fabio, he's too close to avoid him. You know, that's not Fabio's fault either. And Twitter people, that's not Marquez's fault, even if you don't like the guy. That's, you know, that's not his fault that the bike almost threw him off. Fabio, unfortunately, caught up in that. But then a bit of the Yamaha, seemingly the, the fairing, was stuck sort of in the back of Marquez's bike. Uh, he said, Marquez said in an interview afterwards, he went into the next couple of corners, thought everything was fine. Obviously, he'd realised he'd been hit from behind, but he went to the next couple of corners, thought everything was fine. And then coming out of like turn six or turn seven, I, I don't know, because sometimes like the little kinks count as corners, so it's hard to remember, but coming out of a, a right-hander that maybe... Turn seven, because they do, yeah. yeah, that kink is six. Yeah, stupid, I don't know why. <laughs> right, so t- turn seven, probably about the fifth real corner, if I'm being honest, but there you go. <laughs> turn seven, coming out of there, he apparently engaged his ride height device, and then he noticed the bike was pulling to the left, is what he said. Uh, so I think what happened then was obviously the debris that was stuck probably got like compressed down by the ride height device and it was pulling like there was now the tire was now catching so it's pulling him he tries to sort of look around see what's happening also try and get out of the way and unfortunately Nakagami's on his outside they touch Nakagami then folds the front then hits him again and falls off and then I don't know how everybody behind avoided him so that was two crashes on the first lap where there was someone right in the middle of the track everybody managed to sort of avoid them a lot of people lost a lot of time. I think Rins lost a lot of time from the Fabio crash. Um, a few riders, I think, uh, I think both the Tech 3 riders, I think Vinales, they both had to go off the track to avoid uh, Nakagami. Now, Nakagami, I do believe, has injured his hand. I'm not sure what he's done, but I've seen a photo of him with a cast around his hand, or a bandage at least, anyway. So, not sure what injury he's picked up there, because I haven't seen, but I've seen the picture. So, hopefully, Nakagami is okay. Um from that, but he did get up, so it'd be it'd be only a, a minor injury if it was anything. It wouldn't be anything too major for him. But yeah, just chaotic first lap. I know I've gone on a bit there, but two incidents, just two unfortunate racing incidents. Marquez cannot be blamed for either of them. I know there's going to be people that say it's his fault, but he can't. These things just happen, and fortunately, everybody's okay. And obviously, after that, Marquez did retire because he, he got so much damage. But fortunately, everyone's okay. That's the most important thing. Uh, just to fill in a small gap in what happened to Fabio's chest, on the way back from the crash, on the back of a scooter, he had another accident. The scooter collided with another scooter head-on, and all the damage done to his chest was from that accident because his letters were open and he doesn't wear any underlayer. So oh. two crashes again. And so he crashed twice in Assen, and once again he's crashed today. It was kind of... Well, he uh, crashed the second time. <laughs> yeah, so the second time he was thrown off, we'll say... But that's where his injuries come from. Um, unlucky, terrible for his championship. Um, by uh, Bastianini's done him a bit of a favor, really. Five points kept himself, kept him in it a bit more than it could have been. So, phew, Jesus, this is blown wide open. Each week we're kind of going, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. It's on now. Well, I have such a big question now that it's great being 60, 50, 40, 30 points back. He can just uh, Bagnay can just go just put in his race if I crash I crash my championship is over now it's down to 5 10 12 points and he actually has to take the championship lead will his mindset change will he be able to do it will Bastianini play a part in this championship there's so many questions we have and again we can't wait and we don't have to wait till the end of this week and we'll get to see what happens in Japan but how do you see Fabio's championship go from here after bad Aragon race? A couple of tracks now that won't suit the bike necessarily and will suit his opponents. Is he playing second fiddle or is he still favourite? It's not looking good for him now. I will be honest. I mean, it was already not looking great because he had now uh, Banyai within like 30 points. But now Banyai is only 10 points behind him. So... You know, it's just it's it's getting close. It's uh, it's tracks that he's not going to be too good at. I mean, there is obviously there is the variable of weather. Now you don't exactly think, oh, Yamaha are really good in the rain, but actually the Yamaha is not bad in the rain. It's just not very good in the wet, dry conditions, the mixture. So if you do get proper monsoon weather, which is predicted for Mategi, I think it is predicted to be wet all three days. It could help Fabio because I'm not so sure. I don't think Bagnaia or Bastianini are actually that like, good in the wet. I think they struggle. 
And I think that probably could be said for some of the other Ducati riders. Now, Jack Miller, on the other <laughs> hand, is pretty good in the rain. So he might also do his teammate a favor. But interestingly enough, if the, the weather could play a part and you could see you could see it completely flip around, Fabio could win a wet race and Bagnaia could end up crashing in a wet race. It's very easy to do either of those. You know, it could even get worse for Fabio. He could crash in a wet race. Now, I'm not saying it's only going to be a wet race, but it's worth considering because we are getting to that point of the, the year. Obviously, I know a lot of these races are flyaway rounds. So, you know, it's not the same seasons as is as around the rest of the world. But, you know, Japan, Thailand, these places are very monsoonial, you know, so you can get these things fill up island because sometimes be really cold or be really abrasive. So you can get weird weather conditions there. Valencia, you know, that's going to be really cold now. It's not a flyaway, but it's one of the races well that's still be. left on the calendar. <laughs> well, yeah, it may, may as well be. It's, it doesn't feel like Spain, does it, um, when you see it? But So it, anything could happen here, and you made a good point. Bastianini could play a part in the championship, because let's not forget, whilst it's not likely, because he's 48 points behind, he is mathematically still in the championship. And if we do get something like a weird wet race, and let's say he does end up winning it, I know I've just said he's probably not very good, but what do I know about MotoGP, really? Not a lot. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my predictions don't tend to be too great. So Our podcast should tell all the viewers that we don't know much about this sport. <laughs> yes, they probably should. Ah, oh, this guy. I mean, I'm pretty sure I sat there and said that Manuel had no hope of the championship at one point, and uh, he now looks probably bolted on for the favourite currently. So, you know, I'm uh, not always best with predictions, but y- you never know. These kind of things could happen. I mean, there's five races left. He only needs to make up 48 points. That's a lot. But two DNFs, that's him in there. No, and if you think about it, that's 48 to Fabio, but it's only 38 to Bagnaia. So that's all of a sudden a lot closer to one race win and a few beatings. So, you know, it, it can happen. So even though Enea isn't really in the championship, mathematically is there, and obviously he's going to be fighting for himself, clearly as he's shown today and back in Mazzano. He don't care about whether Bagnaia wins it. He's, just, he, he's not going to take him out. He's going to be careful at passing him, but he's definitely going to beat him if the, the opportunity's there. Elaish. You know, Aleish had a good weekend. Well, I don't know. It was a bit of a tough weekend to begin with, but in the end, it ended up well for him after a tough run of form. So Aleish might be a bit more confident. He's still kind of there. So it's it's tough to say. It's not looking good for Fabio. I will say that. And he's going to need some intervention, probably the weather being the most likely thing. I mean, Bastian, he could do him a favour. He could end up falling in the front underneath Banya. You don't know. It could come to that at some point. Uh, yeah, fisty cuss in the gravel trap, you know, these kind of, these kind of things that could happen. Set, set 2023 but, up perfectly. <laughs> oh, that would be... <laughs> the ten, They already have the wall down. Forget Rossi Lorenzo. <laughs> <laughs> Banyoye Bashnini already got the wall down. Uh, so, yeah, it, if, if, it can go anyway. But, yeah, it's not looking good for Fabio. They're looking good for Banyoye. But one of his allies may be a thorn in his side, Bashnini there. He's probably still going to be going for himself. So... Even if he can't win the championship, third in the championship is pretty likely. Like he, he's got a good shot of that, so he'd probably be gunning for that because that's that's still a medal at the end of the day. Yeah, and in all that, we you briefly touched on on Aleish and how his weekend. His weekend started off poor, two crashes, struggled. It looked like again Maverick had serious pace over. Him. Maverick had a great Friday, not great Saturday, and it just went away from on Sunday again. Did get caught up in board incidents on lap one. Yeah, I think that's what did him there. I don't think he... Uh, well, his qualifying his, his first crash great. as well for yeah. Maverick, so Which, that cost him big time, I believe. Hmm. In, it, easy well, it, turn two. Very easily done, but if you look back, if he was slightly further good, he probably wouldn't have caught up in both them incidents, and we could have been talking today about another brilliant podium for Maverick, but no, finished 14th, I believe, so he was way, way further back than his teammate. His teammate had a great scrap with... The factory Ducati of Jack Miller and the other factory KTM of Brad Binder, who got a great, got a great start and made hey, well the sun shine when yeah, because Mark had followed it. Out. <laughs> yeah, around the outside into They're on the outside. They both went <laughs> two men that you just trust to find a way forward. But yeah. Binder, brilliant result for him. But Aleish, seventeen points off. Is he going to be able to do it? Is he a man that can take 20 points in a wet race? Is he going to be consistent enough? Will We've realistically four championship riders going into the four or five rounds left. Is Aleish really going to have enough or is it going to be Fabio or Bagnaia? Oh, it's tough to say, isn't it? 
I mean, Aleish, he's, st- he's still there. So who would have thought Aleish would still be in contention at this point of the season? I mean, like we saw the, the Aprilia in testing. Oh, that bike looks good. You know, he, he looked good in the first couple of races. And it's like Aleish is the lead in the championship. Well, wow, that's cool. But like, it felt like how Crutchlow led the championship back in like 2018. Like it just felt like one of those things where, well, it's been a weird couple of races. He'll drop back to his normal position usually. But no, he's still there. He's still within a shot. Like I said, anything could happen. You can have weird races. These flyaway, flyaway rounds bring up weird races. That's the whole reason why people thought, oh, Aleish was just being there as a fluke because the flyaways are weird at the start of the season. I mean, we saw what happened there. Banyaya had an absolute mare in the last set of flyaways. Remember, crashed up the inside of Martin at Qatar. I think, I don't know where he was in Argentina, but he he was nowhere in Mandalika as well. I think he picked up about like one point from like the first three races or something like that. Like, barely anything pretty much woeful time so you get these kind of weekends it, it's shown that it can you know it can show to be how it's possible you know a shaman might fly out to <laughs> japan or to thailand and make it rain you never know so <laughs> these things can happen so with just it's just uh, i mean i know i've not really answered much of a question yes i think LA still has a chance because there's so many variables the tracks are weird the surfaces of the tracks are weird the weather's weird. I mean, there's freight problems. You know, Banyai's bike might not turn up to one of the races or something. You know, <laughs> we've seen everything. Has, everything has happened this season. So <laughs> I'm not ruling anything out. Yeah, <laughs> you did cover that. We had the the craziness of Indonesia. We had issues going to Texas, to Argentina. To, it's actually to, missing the morning on Friday, aren't they, as well, for the freight? Yeah, the, the Moto3 Afternoon. won't have a... They'd only have an FP2, it'll be their first session. So they are cutting a fine. And like you mentioned, it is apparently going to be like monsoon conditions. So what condition the track will be in? Will there be any running? Will it be safe? Will we get a delayed race? Will we get a race on a Monday? They always say they'll never do that, but delayed race for us Europeans would be absolutely golden. If they delayed it all to about 8 o'clock at night, we'd be in absolute bliss for us over here in UK and Ireland so really it's just just so many variables going into the end of this championship and I even now I still think Fabio will win it but I'm thinking I I the way I think the way I see it is I'm thinking Fabio as a rider versus Peko as a rider I think Fabio will do it but then when you factor in Yamaha Ducati Ducati. Oh, yeah. If it was just head to head riders, Fabio would wrap the championship up about half a year ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you have a hard that's let him down. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just, just so many unanswered questions for this one, and it's going to roll all the way in. It'll be same next week. Whatever happens next week, we'll be going, geez, we still don't know. Maybe at the end of Valencia, after the championships won, we might have an I'm idea. Not, yeah, I might on. have a good idea of who's going to win it, after, like, you know, starting the final lap at Valencia, maybe. Yeah, yeah <laughs> maybe. If I was to tell you then. But that is it for us today. We will be back in a week's time for the Japanese Grand Prix. Reese, quick prediction for MotoGP race. Who is getting it wet, dry, somewhere in between? Right, dry, um, Bashanini, wet, Oliveira. In between, Miller. Ooh, so I'm <laughs> going to take the wild card that you overlooked, either forgot or didn't know. If it's wet, Mark Marquez. If it's in between, Mark Marquez. If it's dry, Pekka Bagnaia. Oh. So, yeah, I I reckon if you take away some of the physicality, Mark Marquez will be there. Remember, Honda's home track. We could have some fireworks. But yeah, so, he, might, he might do a money off, send someone to the show. Oh, geez, imagine, yeah, imagine <laughs> he just picks up Fabio into turn three and then picks, like, it happens. It's a... It'd be 2015 all over again. Oh, please, <laughs> Marcus, please. Oh, I can't have it. I, I, geez, that's all we need now. We, we just need a clean ending because it, it would have been, it's after getting down up to 10 points. We don't really know how it's going to end. So it's, it's going to be, we, we could sit here thinking about it until the race has come in Japan and we still want to answer. So it's, <laughs> it's probably best we end it here. And that is what probably. we'll do. So, Thank you for tuning in today. If you did enjoy, drop a like on the YouTube side. If you are listening on Spotify, drop us a five-star rating. I should see you all in a week's time. Bye-bye. Thanks for now.